For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This message has been brought to you by Mana Christian Fellowship, Helensburg, Washington, area code 509 925 Why sit we here till we die, huh? There's work to be done. I was thinking about it while Brother Jake was preaching and sharing with us. You know, my background, which is a long way back now, <clears throat> but some of my background, they had this term that they use, uh, full-time Christian service, you know? And uh, sometimes there are meetings like this and preach a sermon like our brother just preached and try to get two or three of you to come up here and yield your lives to full-time Christian service. And I have no problem with that, except that I think we ought to expand the thing a bit more. Every one of us is called to full-time Christian service. And if we're going to give it an invitation, we ought to all be up here at the altar surrendering our lives to full-time Christian service. I'm going to serve God with all of my heart and soul and strength all the days of my life and in everything that I do. And I might make a few tents on the side while I'm at it. Amen? Full-time Christian service. Are you ready for that? That's what God is calling us to. Every one of us. Boys. Every one of us. Girls. That's what he's calling us to. Well, that's not my sermon tonight, but I could easily make it my sermon tonight. I just enjoyed the challenge that our brother brought to us in this opening meditation. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Can we do that? God, our Father, send revival, Lord. Send revival, Lord, that all of your people are in full-time Christian service, Father. Thank you for the challenge this evening. We receive it in Jesus' name, Lord. We acknowledge it as truth. We acknowledge that it is what you're doing in every one of our hearts. Oh, give us grace, Lord, to yield. To yield to thee in everything in every way, in every area of our lives, Father. Father, we come to this message this evening. This message that has to do with ordination, ordaining a preacher, a pastor, an elder in the church. Oh, Father, I pray, will you attend to these words, O God, just as much as you would to a revival message, Father? Would you attend to these words, God? Would you take them and write them deeply on the tables of our hearts, Father? For it is thy word, and thy word is beautiful, and it's precious, and it's right. The statutes of the Lord are right. They work. We acknowledge that, Father. I pray, give us open hearts as we sit here this evening and look into your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we're we're here this weekend to set in order the things that are lacking. If I can use the words of Paul to Titus, one of the men that worked with Paul the Apostle, doing apostolic work, doing church planting work, Paul said to Titus, I have left you in Crete that you may set in order the things that are lacking. That's what this weekend is about. It uh, stirs my heart to see so many of you coming from so many different places. And 
it would be so easy to just take off down the road and preach revival messages and, and uh, let's hit the altar and let's do business with God. But we're here for an ordination weekend and you have come as visitors and I guess God has brought you here that you can also walk through this weekend, learn some of the principles which God has in His Word concerning the ordaining of elders and concerning our responsibility to the ordaining of elders. It seems that God has called you here for that because that's what the agenda is for the weekend. Some of the messages will be challenging, inspirational messages. Other messages will be instructional messages because God has given us some beautiful principles in His Word in the New Testament concerning the subject of ordaining elders. And I would like to address some of those subjects this evening. The title of my message tonight is The Gift of a Pastor. The Gift of a Pastor. I'm going to do this evening what nobody else here in this fellowship can do. And I'm going to do what only a visiting minister can do and say. We're going to speak to the fellowship here and to all of you about what some of your responsibilities are to the elder or the pastor that God is giving you. That um, I'm sure that uh, this message will make our brother Jamie very uncomfortable. He would be just as glad to depart from this meeting tonight, I assure you. Nevertheless, the Word of God is clear on our responsibility to our elders. It's beautiful. It's lovely. You know how God's Word is. Whenever God reveals a truth to us, if we will walk in that truth, we will prosper underneath it. We will find it a blessing. We will see beautiful things happen in our lives and in the lives of the church that we live in and in the life of the elders that are our elders. So it's very important that we open up our hearts to that which God reveals in His Word in the New Testament concerning the responsibility of the church to its elders. <clears throat> now the church here is a growing church, a church that is developing, and things need to be set in order, and there will be changes after this weekend. I'm sure that you already are aware of that. <clears throat> The lines of leadership up until now have been a bit gray. Uh, there's been moderating leadership here, but moderating leadership is not ordained leadership. And so, therefore, the, the lines of leadership have been a bit gray. They're not going to be gray after this weekend. And some of you have longed for clarity in the leadership here of this fellowship, and it, the time has come. <coughs> so I want to speak on the scriptural direction of how we should relate to our leaders. And, you know, the Bible, the Bible is a beautiful balancing book. I don't know if you've noticed that, but God's Word balances itself so beautifully. And in this matter of uh, elders and the subject that we have here this evening, again, it gives a beautiful balance. Think about it with me for a moment. God says to the leader, I want you to be a servant and lay down your life for your flock. But God doesn't say to the flock, I'm giving you a servant. He is your servant. Go tell him what to do. God doesn't say that to the flock. God says to the leader, you are a servant, you are a slave, I want you to lay down your life for the sheep here. But God says to the sheep, I am giving you a leader, I want you to honor him and respect him. You see those two? And they beautifully balance together. Just like God says to us husbands, I want you to love your wife and lay down your life for, for her. And God says to the wives, I want you to submit to your husband and reverence him. But God doesn't give those verses to each of us to use on the other. Do you understand that? 
it just doesn't go well, does it, husbands, if we sit our wives down and say, now listen here, you know what the Bible says that you're supposed to do with me. It doesn't go well. It's the same way this beautiful balance of the responsibilities that an elder has and the responsibilities that the church has to its elders. Now, um, Brother Jamie will get his cup full of the responsibilities that he has before the weekend is over. But I feel urgently moved by God to lay some groundwork on the other side of this subject this evening. The gift of a pastor. We want to start our reading here this evening in Ephesians, if you can turn there. Blessed book of Ephesians. We were there this morning. We're here just for a little while here this evening. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 7 through 13. Precious words. <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace. Hallelujah. According to the measure of the gift of Christ, every one of us in this building tonight has been given grace according to the measure of Christ, that measure which Christ has measured to every one of us. Praise God. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts on the men. He led captivity captive and gave gifts on the men. Do you believe that tonight? Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And brothers and sisters, this evening, He is in the process of filling all things. We are here this evening that Christ, who is the head of the church, may continue His work of filling all things. Verse 11, And He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that perfect man there, brothers and sisters, is not you being a perfect man and you being a perfect man and me being a perfect man. It's speaking about a local church coming to the place where they are unified, where they are unified in the faith, and they are as a mature man, a mature body of Jesus Christ, connected to the head, functioning, flowing from the strength and grace that the head gives to each member of the body. That's the mature man that Paul is speaking about here in Ephesians chapter 4. That's where God is going. And dear brothers and sisters, God is giving you an elder with that in mind. And as I understand it here in the, in the text, in the context here, it is a gift. It is a gift. A gift. Now looking at uh, verse 12, the way that I understand verse 12, God is not giving us these different offices, men to fulfill these different, different offices, so they can perfect the saints and do the work of the ministry and edify the body. I don't understand it that way. The way I would understand that verse is simply this. God gives those gifts to men and those men as gifts to people for the perfecting of the saints or that the saints might be matured so that the saints can do the work of the ministry and edify the body of Christ. That's the way I understand those verses. So, we have to be careful here, you know, some would interpret different than that, and, you know, the preacher does everything, and there's only one man who preaches, and everybody else sits and listens. We don't believe that. You know, we believe, would God that all of God's people would prophesy. That's God's heart. 
that the church would be filled with men that are full of the Holy Ghost and have something to say. Amen? Well, that takes place because God gives pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets and even apostles to the church. So this evening we're looking at the gift of a pastor. <clears throat> I would like you just to ponder that for a moment. You know, the best way for you to get a good glimpse of what God is doing for you, I'm speaking to the local ones here, the best way to explain what God is doing for you is for you just to ponder how it has been already. No leadership, no pastor, no direction, nobody to watch over you, nobody to care for your soul. And then all of a sudden, God in His mercy gives you the gift of a pastor. How do you receive a gift like that? What should our response be? These are the things that I would like us to meditate upon a bit this evening. How do we receive such a gift? Well, first of all, we recognize it is a gift from God. A gift from God. How do you receive a gift from God? You receive it with gratitude you recognize God is giving me this gift because I need it. Because I need it. <clears throat> God is giving you this gift for the perfecting of the saints that you might be equipped for the work of the ministry. I'm not sure how that sets with you, but I believe that. It is the work of the ministers in a church to equip the church for the work of the ministry. It is not the ministry of the ministers to do all the preaching and everyone else sits and listens. It is the work of the ministry to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And if, you're, if you question that, why well, just go to the book of Acts and see how many people were busy about God's work in the book of Acts. Yes, there were twelve apostles. Yes, they were the leaders. Yes, they gave lots of direction. But those people went everywhere preaching and teaching the Word of God. They went everywhere. And that's the way God wants it to be. And God in His wisdom has set certain things in motion to begin to make that happen. And one of those is the gift of a pastor or an elder. And as I use these terms, I want you to know, to me, as I've studied in the New Testament, they're synonymous words. Pastor, elder, presbyter, bishop, overseer, all the same words. Just different functions of the same office. All the same words. The gift of a pastor. <clears throat> <clears throat> there are, as I look in the New Testament, seven different areas which give some direction to us and help us to understand how we are supposed to relate to those elders or elder that God has given us. Let me give you these seven ways and then we will look at them one at a time. Number one, we are to esteem them. Number two, we are to follow them. Number three, we are to pray for them. Number four, we are to know them. Number five, we are to obey them. Number six, we are to support them. And number seven, we are to protect them. Those seven areas we would like to cover this evening. Let's turn and read, first of all, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to read about three little portions of Scripture here which cover these seven areas and then we will take these areas, each one in a row. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. We beseech you, brethren, 
to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. 1 Timothy chapter 5 Just a few pages over there. 1 Timothy 5 verse 17 <clears throat> Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Sobering words. Hebrews chapter 13. <clears throat> verse 7 and then verse 17. Verse 7 reads, Remember them which have the rule over you, who has spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not sure. Those two go together real well, don't they, Brother Ken? <laughs> Verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves. For they watch for your soul, as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. <clears throat> All right, these three portions of Scripture clearly reveal these seven principles that I would like to look at here this evening. The first one that we're going to look at is the admon admonition that we are given to esteem them highly in love. God says to the sheep in a flock, to the congregation, to the brothers and sisters in a local church, Concerning your elders, you should esteem them highly in love. That word esteem means give them a place of high honor. Give them a place of high honor. You may say, even in your own mind as you sit here, Now, wait a minute, Brother Denny. It's not good for them. They need to be humble. That's Right. They need to be humble, but God did not call you to humble them. You understand? God does not call you to humble them. Yes, they need to be humble. But brethren, consider with me. Don't you need to be humble? How many of you appreciate having a wife that humbles you again and again? It just doesn't go very far when your wife feels her responsibility to keep you humble by telling you all the things that you're doing wrong. It doesn't go well that way. In fact, you know as well as I do that when your wife encourages you, when she comes alongside of you and blesses you, when she sees beautiful things in you, it moves you way further ahead when she comes alongside and says, you didn't do very well in that. That wasn't a very good sermon. You didn't have very much wisdom when you talked to that person. That doesn't work. God's Word says that we shall esteem them very highly in love. That's what it says. That's not what I said. These aren't my words. You should esteem them very highly in love. 
Why? For their work's sake. For their work's sake. <clears throat> it's true. God says to them, be a humble servant, wash people's feet, expect nothing. And that's the posture that an elder ought to have. But that's not the posture that the people ought to have. He doesn't need any encouragement. I don't want to, I don't want to bless him after he gives a good message. He might get puffed up in pride. Listen. Let me tell you a few uh, inside secrets about preaching the Word of God. Just a few inside secrets. The devil will beat him and beat him and beat him. You give him some encouragement. Esteem him highly in love for the work's sake. <coughs> Notice that it says there in Timothy, double honor to those who rule well, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, I would like you to just note here, brothers and sisters, that word labor there, those that labor in the word and doctrine. That word labor is the same word that we would use when we would say, I went out and cut wood all day. We labored. If we went out into the woods and we chopped wood all day, we labored. It's the same word. And I'm here to tell you from my own experiences that those who labor in the word, listen, messages don't come by accident. They come by grit. They come by labor. They come by fasting. They come by prayer. They come by battles that you have no idea of. When you have a man who will feed you the Word of God, you count him worthy of double honor and give him a blessing and bless him for his labors and, and esteem him highly in honor. Let me tell you something else it will do for you. When you have that kind of heart toward the man who stands to give you the Word of God, guess what? You will get more out of the message. It's just that way. I mean, if in your mind you're thinking, yeah, you know, who is he? And well, who does he think he is? And why is he up? You know, if you have all those thoughts, you won't get much. But if your heart says, bless God, we have a leader. God has given us a pastor. This pastor's been praying. He's going to preach the Word of God to us. I want to listen with all my heart. You know what? You get more out of the message. I guarantee it. And you know who else will get more out of the message? Those little children sitting next to you will sense what your attitude is towards the preacher. They will sense what your attitude is. I've often said it, and it's true, it holds true everywhere I go. I can, I'll say to parents, I know how you feel about me. I met your little boy, four years old, over there in the corner when you weren't around. I know how you feel about me. That's right. And you know what I met that when I met that little four-year-old boy? He came up to me like, Hello, Brother David. Hello, Brother David. I know what his mom and dad think about me. I don't need to go ask anybody. And how much do you think that little four-year-old is going to get out of that message? He's going to get something out of that message. Now, I could just tell you what God says and tell you to go do it, but I'm giving you some of the secrets behind the scenes. This is why God says to do it. Esteem Him, God says. Esteem Him. I know, I'm speaking to some in this room. These are whole new thoughts to you. Well, we don't do that. We don't esteem a minister. They might get proud. You don't go up to them and say, Praise God for that message you gave. They might get proud, you know. Don't want them to be stumbling in pride. And pray tell me, how do you esteem them highly in love if you don't feel that respect in your own heart? 
you can't do it. God is telling us, this is not a little one. Esteem him highly in love. <clears throat> and it says, for their work's sake. <clears throat> Rejoice, dear brothers and sisters. Here's a man who is willing to be an elder. <clears throat> willing to be an elder. Willing to make the sacrifice. Willing to stay up late. Willing to get up early. Willing to be misunderstood. Willing to be stepped on. Willing to be accused. Willing to be surmised about. Willing to do all those things. You better rejoice! That you've got somebody that's willing to do that. Because those are all the things that are going to happen to him. As the church life rolls on, those are all the things that are going to happen to him. You rejoice that God has given you somebody who's willing to do that. <clears throat> all right, let's move on. The, the next point is follow him. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7 says, Whose faith follow? Amen? Do you know what that means? Whose faith follow? It means, you look and see how he's living out his faith and you follow his example. Just like Peter said in 1 Peter to the elders that he was writing to, being an example to the flock. Why be an example to the flock? Because the flock has been instructed to follow the example of their preacher. Whose faith follows. You know, I, it's some time ago now, so it's, it's a good ways back, but some time ago we had a brother in the church and he was there and and, uh, you know, he was, he didn't really plug into the church, but he was there. And, uh, he didn't really want to get involved, but he was there. And he didn't really fit in, but he was there. And he didn't really want to do what we were doing, but he was there. Finally, we approached him and talked to him a little bit about this, and, and this is what he said. He said, Oh, Brother Denny, Please don't make me leave. I like your preaching. I don't agree with everything you say. I couldn't order my life the way you do. But I like your preaching. Please let me stay. Well, listen. There's lots of churches where you can hear good sermons. <laughs> I mean, there are lots of places where you can get a good sermon. There aren't very many places where you find people who follow the faith of their pastor. There aren't very many places like that. Whose faith follows? <clears throat> how he guides his family. How he speaks. How he dresses. How he orders his life. That is the expression of his faith. Follow his faith. You understand? And sometimes I think we we've been infected by the evangelical world more than we realize. And we think that church is a place where you come and hear good sermons and go home and do what you want. That's not so. Not according to the Bible. That's not so. Whose faith follows. That's what the Bible says. And I've said it many places and many times. Don't ordain somebody that you're not willing to follow. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. Don't ordain somebody that you're not willing to follow. Somebody that you're not willing to look up to their life and say, I want to order my life after them. Follow them. Follow their example. <clears throat> They're to be an example to the flock. Follow their example in devotional life, in family life, in personal convictions, in business life, in church life. And what a joy that is to you. Think about it. Remember how much faster we learn 
how much quicker we grow if what we hear we also see? Amen? It's, you know, the little poem, it's true. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Brothers and sisters, you will grow faster if you also follow the example of your elder. You put the preaching and the living together and you've got quick growth. Quick growth. Whose faith follows? That's what God's Word says. <laughs> what an easy way to serve from a pastor's perspective. What an easy way to serve. To serve a people who want to follow. What more could a pastor ask for than that? Many times I've talked on the telephone to men who are pastors in different places in the United States and they're trying to lead a group of people who don't want to follow. When I get off the phone, I bow my head many times or lift up my heart in thanksgiving to God and say, Father, thank you. I get to minister to a bunch of people who want to follow. What a privilege. What an easy way to preach. Number three, pray for them. This is a responsibility of the church to the elders. Pray for them. Pray fervently for them. Pray often for them. Paul was constantly asking for prayer. Have you noticed that in the epistles? He was always asking, pray for me. Remember me. Pray that I might have utterance. He was constantly doing that. You know why he was constantly asking that? He knew how much he needed their prayer. Pray for them. Hold them up in prayer. You know, we remember the missionaries. What's the difference between a minister and a missionary? Is there any difference? Is the minister on the front line just like the missionaries on the front line? Yes, he is. Is the devil out to destroy his life like the devil's out to destroy a missionary's life? Yes, he is. No doubt about it. But many times we pray for the missionary over there, but we don't pray for the pastor that is right here. Pray for them. When they're facing decisions, give extra time in prayer for them. <clears throat> Pray for them on Saturday when they're preparing for the sermon on Sunday. Pray for them on Sunday while you sit in the meeting and listen to them. Pray for them. I once read an account of a pastor who did an experiment on Sunday morning in his church. He had a large church, several hundred people. And he told the congregation, he said, I want to do an experiment this morning. <clears throat> I have a burden on my heart. I have a message that I would like to give. <clears throat> it's heavy on my heart. I want it to be received properly. I want to ask every one of you if you will pray for me silently in your heart while I preach this message. How many of you will do that? Of course, the whole congregation may raise their hand. <laughs> Who wouldn't? I mean, they were on the spot for sure. <clears throat> but nevertheless, they all prayed for him while he gave his message. His testimony was, he never had a message go like that in his life. It was just like as if God picked him up and carried him all the way through the message. Hallelujah! What a beautiful way to give a message. God just picked me up and carried me all the way through the message. What a blessing it is when a congregation will get underneath their pastor and pray for them while he's preaching. I've been to places where the people carry you while you preach. 
And I mean it's smooth sailing all the way. I've also been to other places where I carried the whole load myself. <clears throat> and it's much harder to preach that way. Much harder. Pray for him on Saturday. Pray for him while he's preaching on Sunday. <clears throat> Pray protection over him. You know, the enemy is out to get him. You can be sure of that. Pray for his family. You know, the enemy is out to get his family. You can be sure of that. Pray at devotion time in your home. Pray at meal time. Pray on Saturday evening. Gather your family together on Saturday evening and pray earnest prayers saying, God, bless the preacher tomorrow. You know what? You're not just praying for his benefit. You will get the benefit. You will get it rolling back on you if you will take up this matter of prayer and make it a serious thing. Have special times of prayer for your minister. It's very important. I can remember a couple different ones in our fellowship at home. They're not there anymore. Bless God, they prayed themselves out of the prayer closet and into the ministry. But I can remember them. <clears throat> I can remember one dear brother. He prayed for me on Saturdays. I mean, he prayed for me on Saturdays. He didn't pray a prayer for me on Saturdays. He prayed for two or three hours for me on Saturday. Imagine that, Brother Ken. Wow. Many times on Sunday morning. <clears throat> He would come up to me after the message and show me the outline that God gave him yesterday in prayer. And it was my outline that I gave that morning. Sometimes I begin to wonder, now who's giving this message? Him or me? But you know what he was doing? He was praying the message down from God for the congregation. What a blessing that was! To have a man who would pray like that! We have a sister in the congregation that prays like that. Not just a little prayer, but a specific time where they get alone and just pour out their heart before God for the minister tomorrow. Pray for them. It's part of our responsibility. Number four. We read the scriptures there in Thessalonians. It says, know them. Know them. That's an interesting word. That's an interesting word in this uh, modern, high-tech age that we live in. You know, you can, you can get on the radio and hear, you know, uh, what is it, 37 different flavors of ministers. You can hear them all on the radio. You can get on the Internet and, and you can just go everywhere you want. You can get everything you can imagine off of there. But the Bible says, know them. Do you know them? What does it mean? What does Paul mean when he says to the Thessalonians, Know them which labor among you. <clears throat> he means this. Get to know them. Learn how they think. Find out what the deep burdens of his heart are. Find out what makes him pick. Find out what the burdens are that God is laying on His heart. That's what it means to know them. It means spend time hearing their hearts. It means spend time drawing out of them their vision. Get their heart on biblical issues and conviction. That's what it means. Know that. Know that. Recently, I heard the account of a young man who had the opportunity to work for one of his ministers. He had a whole day that he's going to be working for one of his ministers. And he was a young man, but he was 
a wise young man. And he thought, oh boy, I've got the whole day with my minister. After another, after another, after another, all day long. You know what he was doing? He was knowing him that labors among him. That's what he was doing. His heart said, I've got the whole day with my minister. I'm going to find out what makes him tick. I'm going to find out what the burdens are on his heart. I'm going to ask him every question that I can think of about every issue on spiritual things that I can come up with. I'm not going to waste this day. I've got a minister with me all day long. I'm going to ask him everything I can. That was a wise young man. He did not waste his day, nor his time. <clears throat> Some of this takes time. To know them which labor among you takes time. Time, a length of time, meaning a couple years. Some of it takes time, a space of time. You have to take the time to get to know him. <clears throat> And some of it just simply takes interest. You know, like the young man, he had the interest. And when God gave him the time, he seized the opportunity that was given to him. He had the interest. I want to know what makes this minister tick. I want to know what the burdens are on his heart. This is a wise thing to do. And I just give you a little caution about all the radio preachers today. Many times, and I've said this before, you wouldn't fit into their congregation. <clears throat> you wouldn't fit into their congregation. You wouldn't want to be there. <clears throat> <clears throat> know them which labor among you. Number five. Obey them. Hebrews. 13 again, verse 17. Obey them which have the rule over you. And over there in Timothy, it says, Count those who rule well. Double honor. That word rule means rule. <laughs> Sorry. It means what it says. It means administrate. It means give direction. It means watch over your life. It's the same word as where it talks about uh, giving the qualifications, which Brother Ken will share with us some tomorrow, where it talks about the qualifications of a bishop and how he should rule his own house well. It's talking about order and leadership and direction and administration. And whether you've had a bad experience in all of that or not, it's still in the Bible. Obey them. <clears throat> they have authority. God has given them authority. We need to recognize that authority. It's very important that we do that. Recognize. This is a man that God has placed as an overseer in my life. Recognize the authority. <clears throat> now I want to quickly say that word obey is not the same word that God gives in Ephesians 6 where God says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. It's not the same word. Obviously, God is not calling us as brothers and sisters to blind obedience to, to a minister. It doesn't mean that. It's not that strong of a word. But here's what it means. It means... Allow yourself to be persuaded in the direction of that which the minister is giving. That's what it means. Give in to the direction of your minister. It doesn't mean he must go around and tell you, do this, don't do that, go here, don't go there, stop this, go here. No, 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 no. Just give your heart over to the direction that the minister is giving into your life. <clears throat> the word obey is a word of submission. <clears throat> it is a word of rule. It says you're to follow their direction. 
It says, let them lead out and you follow. Now, I don't know how that sets with you and, you know, I'm sure that we could find many more inspirational subjects here this evening. But the fact of the matter is, if we don't have a church, what do we have? God, in His wisdom, has set the church in order and He has set order in the church. And some of that order is ministers, elders, Pastors, overseers, bishops. Same word. Same word. God in His wisdom knew that we as sheep would need the direction of spiritual men who were called to be overseers. This is one of the reasons why when we have an ordination, it's not an ordination. You don't choose the man who has the best sermon No, you don't go get somebody from somewhere else and have him come in and give you a sermon and if you like his sermon, you're going to be your minister. No, you choose out from among you. You know who your minister is. You've already walked with him. You sense God's call. All these things play into this matter of submitting to the authority of those that you have recognized God is calling them to lead this church. And therefore, I'm going to follow. I'm going to follow. By the way, you'll prosper if you do follow. You will. I thought about your children earlier this afternoon as I was meditating. Fathers, mothers, your children need to see you submit your heart to the leadership of a fellowship, of a church. Your children need to see you do that. They need to see you bow your heart. They need to see you bow your heart when you don't agree. You make them do it, don't you? You expect them to bow their hearts sometimes when they don't agree. How are they going to learn to do that if they can't see you do it? You see the secret wisdom hidden behind these principles. Now God says to the elders that they are servant leaders. They are not to be lords over God's heritage. God says those words to them. Again, He balances the things very beautifully, you know, so that the leader's not walking around thinking, you need to do what I say, and I'm in charge around here. No, that's the wrong attitude for the leader to have. But oh, how sad it is if the followers somehow think the leader is here to do what we say. No, no. Whose faith follow? Obey them that have the rule over you. They watch for your soul. That's what the Bible says. They're responsible to watch for your soul. And whether you realize it or not, God at times will give them special insight into your life And you're a fool if you don't listen to that insight when it comes. God will give them special insight. You know why? Because He has made them overseers. That's just the way it is. God channels His wisdom through different methods and one of those methods is through the overseers that you have in your life. And think about it. We read it over here in Hebrews 13 and 17. Obey them to have the rule over you. Submit yourselves. Notice that. It doesn't just say do what they say. Submit yourselves. Let let your heart be a heart that says Amen to what the preacher says. But here's why. They watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy. 
and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. <coughs> now just consider with me. It's not very pleasant to oversee somebody who doesn't want any direction in their life. It's a grief. You do it. You know you're supposed to do it, but it's a grief to do it. You don't do it as well because it's a grief to do it. <clears throat> you don't speak as often because you're afraid you'll get bit if you do. A person who treats their minister like that is cutting their own throat. They basically are saying, stay away from me, don't touch me, don't touch my life, don't give me any direction, I'll do what I want. <clears throat> this is unprofitable for you. This is unprofitable. God says, I'm giving you a gift. The gift of a pastor. Here's how I want you to relate to this pastor that I'm giving you. Allow yourself to be persuaded with the things that he sees. Open your heart to his counsel. Listen to what he has to say. <clears throat> God is working through him to direct your life. Not only through him, but through him. And many other ways. But God is working through him to direct your life. Let him do it with joy. You know, there are certain people, not a whole lot of them I might add, but there are certain people who come to me on a regular basis and say, <clears throat> Brother Denny, I want you to know that I am open to any input that you have in my life. Please care for my soul. Please direct me. Please, I want input from you. Anything you see in my life, anything you see in my family, any direction that you see in, in, in what I'm doing that you have a caution about, I want you to know, I want to hear, please come to me. Do you know, it's so easy to go to somebody like that. I mean, it's a pleasure. You know, it's like going to a faithful son and sitting down with a faithful son and having a little chat with them, knowing that that faithful son is going to listen to what you have to say. That's what it's like. That's to your advantage if you have that kind of an attitude. If you have this kind of an attitude, that is not going to go well for you. <coughs> I know, I know, maybe you got burnt. Maybe somebody was an authoritative leader. Maybe that you were taken advantage of. Uh, that may be so, but listen, it's still in the Bible. And what our human tendency is, when we've had a bad experience, we tend to swing way over here. You know what I'm saying? Way on the other side. You know, we have religious people in the area where we live, and sometimes when they get born again, and realize that all this religious stuff, all this outside stuff, didn't have anything to do with their soul's salvation. And they swing way over to the other side, throw everything off, get a pair of shorts, buy a TV, put a swimming pool in the backyard, and join evangelical Christianity. What did they do? They swung way over here because of something bad that happened over here. No. God would balance our lives with the principles of His Word. And I just want to encourage all of us here this evening not to overreact because of a bad experience. <coughs> Obey them that have the rule over you. Number six, 
support them. Support them. We read the scriptures. We were admonished not to muzzle the ox that treads the corn. That illustration out of the Old Testament was given in the context of giving financial support to our ministers. If you muzzle the ox that treads the corn, he's not going to tread the corn very well. He'll tread it, yes, because he has to, but he won't tread it as well. He won't tread it as fast. His heart won't be in it, but he'll do it. God says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. The burden of the cares of life can be a great burden to a minister. It can be a great burden. It can be a load. It can cause him to do cut corners, which he shouldn't do. I don't know what the financial situation is of the God, of the man that God is calling to lead out here, but to me it really doesn't matter. <clears throat> I feel like a man who is called to lead in the church needs to be given the financial freedom to lead. That means the others help financially, so he has the freedom to do the work that needs to be done. I know we don't, we don't believe in just giving a salary to a minister and letting him go with that. I understand that. We, we think that ministers ought to work and that's fine. I work. I, I enjoy my work and I wouldn't want it any other way. But when the work gets to be so much that you're scramping around to try to find something to give to the church on Sunday morning, on Saturday evening, that doesn't go well. And guess what? You won't get much corn on Sunday morning. <clears throat> Support is more than money, but it is money. Malachi chapter 3 talks about tithe, bringing the tithe into the storehouse, and, and God challenges the, the children of Israel. They're saying, uh, Prove me now, saith the Lord. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse and see if I will pour you out a blessing that you may not be able to contain it. And I don't believe what God is talking about there is you give me your money and I'll multiply it and give you more money than you know what to do with. God is not talking about that even though God does bless us when we give. But I don't believe that's what the the import is of Malachi chapter 3. What God is saying there is He is challenging a nation of Israel who quit taking care of the Levites and the priests and the Levites and the priests went back to work and they didn't have time to prepare and they didn't have time to pray and they didn't have time to seek God and they didn't have time to study and they didn't have time to preach and so the preaching went down and the prayers went down and the fasting went down and the study went down and the people went down. God says, prove me now, saith the Lord. You bring ye all the tithes back into the storehouse and then take those tithes and give them where they're supposed to go and see if I won't pour you out a blessing that you will not be able to contain. We're talking about the principle of making sure that our minister is free enough to seek the Lord and do the work of, of the church. That's what we're talking about. And frankly, we're weak on it. We believe that ministers ought to work so much. We believe that so much. We believe it to our hurt. But supporting your minister is more than money. It means standing beside them. It means affirming them. 
It means when they preach the tough message, you come up afterwards and bless them and thank them for it. It means you write them a letter sometimes and thank them for their input into your life. It means an encouraging word. It means coming up to the preacher and saying, I'm with you. I agree with you. Thank you for taking that stand in the brothers' meeting last night. I'm with you. God bless you. That's supporting your ministry. <clears throat> and lastly, the seventh one, protect him. Protect him? Yes. Protect him. What do I mean by that? We read the scripture there where it, the admonition was given against an elder. Receive not an accusation against an elder except by two or three witnesses. <clears throat> that is the verse that I'm using for this principle. To protect your elders. Don't hear accusations about your elders. That's something that people somehow feel very free to do on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, did you hear what brother so-and-so is doing? Did you hear? Did you hear what happened last week when such and such and such happened? No. What is it? Let me tell you how you should handle that. When someone comes to you and says, Do you know that so-and-so did? You just say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Hold it right there. Brother John? Brother Joe? Here comes Brother John. Here comes Brother Joe. Then you look back at him and say, Okay, uh, now what were you going to say? <laughs> All of a sudden he will feel strangely led to not say anything. That's called protecting your elders. <clears throat> Don't receive accusations. Don't let them just dump on you. Don't let them tell their story to you and say, really, I can't believe that. Don't even go down that road. As soon as you smell somebody starting to say this or that about so-and-so and what he did or whatever, you just get a couple other brothers in there. Wait a minute. This, it seems to me that we have not need a couple of witnesses here. Now, go ahead. What were you going to say? <laughs> what were you going to say? Well, um, I, I guarantee you, they'll sit and stutter and stammer around and it won't come out the way that it was going to come out before. I guarantee you. It's good to do that. It's good to do that. That fits right in with all the other principles that we've been speaking about here. Don't let somebody undo your elder by slandering him, even if what, was, what they want to say is true. Don't let them do it. It won't come out right, I guarantee it. Your elder's going to make some mistakes, I guarantee it. He's a human being just like you are. He's not going to do everything right. He's going to make some mistakes. Protect him from slander. Protect him from those who would like to undo him. Protect him from that. Don't hear those kind of things. You will do the church such a favor if you will do that. Come now, let us reason together, brothers and sisters. Those of you that are here in this local fellowship and all the rest, you know, and come from different places, come now, let us reason together a little bit. God wouldn't give all these principles to us as church members, as brothers and sisters in a local church. He wouldn't give them to us if he did not have specific things in mind that will come forth out of it. I, for one, I believe whenever God tells us to do something, 
he has dozens of blessings hidden in him. Dozens of blessings hidden in him. And if we do not hear what he has to say, and we don't follow his lead through the word of God, we will not experience those blessings. But if we follow his lead, we will be blessed. It will all roll back on you. I promise you. It will all roll back on you. But it will also roll on him. It will also bless him. But that will only roll back on you. I promise you. God knows what he's doing. He is the only wise God. Be honor and glory to him forever and ever. Amen. He is the only wise God. He knows what He's doing in every one of these principles which are clear in the Word of God. Every one of them. I haven't stretched the principles here this evening. It may be new thoughts to you. You may not have heard them before. But I haven't stretched the principles of the Word of God. We need to heed them. (coughs) You may say, I've had leaders that were not esteemable. I've had leaders that were not knowable. I've had leaders that were hard to obey. I've had leaders that were not so easy to follow. And their example wasn't very good. Well, that may be so. But the principles, they're still here. They're in the book. They're in the book. They're in there for a very good reason. So this evening, I will finish the way that I started. I know that um, it would have just been great to have a revival message this evening and all of us to shout amen and hallelujah and all those things tonight. But you came to an ordination weekend. You came. And we have been instructed by God to set in order the things that are lacking. And that's what we're doing this weekend. So I would just encourage you to take these admonitions, ponder them, yeah, discuss them. Just, you know, share back and forth and and, uh, open your hearts one to another, but consider these things. It's part of receiving a ministry. Is part of receiving the ministry. And I want to say this in closing. <clears throat> Just so that you know that I'm not picking any bones myself. I feel more than honored in my congregation at home. I don't think my congregation is not obeying these things. I don't think I'm worthy of how I'm treated at home. That's my testimony. So I'm not picking any bones here. I'm just telling you, these principles work, brothers and sisters. They work. They are some of the principles that make a church go forward and prosper. The minister has some responsibility, and the brothers and sisters also have some responsibility. And when all those flow together, when the minister says, I am going to lay down my life and serve these people. And the people say, I'm going to receive my minister at God's hand as a gift. When those two flow together, you have beautiful, beautiful function in a local church. Beautiful. Sometimes people ask me these kind of questions. <clears throat> Brother Denny, do you push your weight around at times back home in your church? I mean, other times when you have to sit the congregation down and tell them a thing or two and make sure, you know, make sure things go right and all of that. And, you know, I get those questions thrown to me and 
I ponder that for a minute and I, you know, I think maybe I had to do that two times in 20 years. Two times in 20 years where I just simply had to sit down and say, look, brethren, we're not doing right here. This is the way we're going to go. Just do what I say and talk to me. I think maybe two times in 20 years. Why? Because these two things work together. They work together. They work beautifully together. And the church just moves on and goes forward and grows and prospers and God's blessing is upon us. And I want to encourage you to ponder the things that I've given here this evening. Even though maybe <clears throat> maybe it's new medicine for you, I want to encourage you just to ponder May God help us. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we love you tonight, Lord. What a good Father you are to us, Lord God. Lord, my heart fills. To look into these things again this evening, God, my heart overflows with joy. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the beauty of your Word. Thank you for the wisdom of your Word. Lord, you know what you're doing, God. We acknowledge it. These beautiful principles tonight, we receive them in Jesus' name into our hearts, God. Oh, I pray. I pray for this congregation. I pray that it will prosper. I pray that the brothers and sisters here will receive their minister, their, their pastor from Thee, O oh God. And I pray that You will cause this church to prosper in ways it never has before. God, we trust these words in your care. You take them into every heart and do what you need to do in every one of our hearts. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.